New Zealand aerospace startup Rocket Lab just caught a falling rocket booster with a helicopter, and then they immediately dropped it, which is not exactly what we were hoping to see, but it's still pretty damn cool. And this makes Rocket Lab the first company since SpaceX to put an honest effort into recovering their booster. And it's important to remember here that SpaceX did not succeed the first time they tried to land a Falcon 9 booster. They also didn't succeed the second time or even the third time. And when a Falcon misses the landing, it just explodes spectacularly. So the fact that Rocket Lab managed to have a mostly successful booster recovery without even blowing anything up, that's a solid win. What we're really seeing unfold right now is the beginning of a new phase of operations for an aerospace company that has a ton of potential. I don't necessarily want to lean into this idea that they're the next SpaceX, because not everything needs to be an analogy, and Rocket Lab isn't really trying to be anyone other than themselves. They've got a unique vision for what an aerospace company of the future can be, and they're working on some really cool stuff. So let's talk about it. This is the space race. Obviously the big hype for Rocket Lab right now is the helicopter catch. So here's how that all played out. The mission titled There and Back Again blasted off from the company's New Zealand launch complex on May 2nd. The Electron rocket was carrying a payload of 34 small sats. It's important to keep in mind that Electron is a relatively light rocket. The fairing diameter is only 1.2 meters, and the payload capacity is about 200 kilograms. So these satellites are very small. It's hard to get a sense of scale when you see them in space, but in person they're like the size of a toaster to maybe the size of a microwave. The job of the first stage rocket booster is to get that payload through the Earth's atmosphere and into space. Because the Earth has relatively strong gravity and a dense atmosphere, it takes a lot of energy to reach escape velocity. Once that energy is depleted, the booster breaks away from the upper section of the rocket. Now that they're in space, a vacuum optimized engine will fire on the second stage and carry the payload to orbit. For a typical rocket, that first stage booster will simply fall back down to the earth and usually splash down in the open ocean. Unless it's a Russian launch from their Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, in which case they just let the booster slam back into the ground in some remote area of grassland or forest. In the case of a Falcon 9, the booster will hold on to some reserve fuel and use that to burn the engines as it re-enters the atmosphere. This slows the booster down and allows SpaceX to use grid fins to control the descent and bring the rocket back to either a floating barge or a landing pad. Then they time the final landing burn perfectly so that the engines cut out at the moment the booster hits solid ground with its landing legs. The Falcon 9 landing procedure is very complex because if the engines cut off too soon, the booster will free fall and explode. If the engines burn too long, the booster will bounce off the ground and come back up, then tip over and explode. The Rocket Lab Electron Booster takes a more conventional path back to Earth. About two and a half minutes after liftoff, the first and second stages of the rocket will separate. The booster will fall back to Earth at a speed of about 8,300 kilometers per hour. An additional heat shield installed on the reusable booster will protect the structure from re-entry temperatures that reach 2,400 degrees Celsius. After falling from space and re-entering the atmosphere, the Electron deploys its first parachute at 13 kilometers above the ocean. At 6 kilometers altitude, the main chute is extracted. It's kind of the same idea as those model hobby rockets if you've ever tried one of those, but instead of getting caught in a tree or a power line, the Electron parachute gets snagged by a helicopter. So about 15 minutes after the launch of There and Back Again, the slowly descending booster came into view of Rocket Lab's Sikorsky S-92 helicopter. With the parachute deployed, the booster would have been falling at a speed of about 35 kilometers per hour. This is the point where the helicopter pilot goes in for the catch. We know that the maximum lift capacity of this particular helicopter is 5,000 kilograms, and the weight of the electron booster after burning through all of its fuel should be just under 1,000 kilograms. So according to the numbers, this should be well within safety margins. 
Live video from the recovery chopper showed the hook from the helicopter successfully grappling the booster parachute, and the Mission Control Center full of Rocket Lab employees burst into a round of applause and cheers, which were quickly followed by a collective groan and the live video cut out entirely. It was more than an hour before official word from Rocket Lab came back about the recovery. A spokesperson told us, quote, After the catch, the helicopter pilot noticed different load characteristics than what we've experienced in testing. At his discretion, the pilot offloaded the stage for a successful splashdown. So they dropped it, which isn't exactly what we were hoping for, but as someone who has never and will never catch a spaceship with a helicopter myself, I'm not going to lay any judgment on that pilot. And neither did Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck, who was absolutely ecstatic about the results of his first real world recovery test. In an interview with CNBC, Beck called the launch phenomenal saying that the test achieved 99% of the company's goals towards reusing rockets. Beck told reporters, quote, Yesterday was a demonstration that it all works. It's all feasible. You can successfully control and re-enter a rocket stage from space, put it under a parachute, and then go and recover it with a helicopter in mid-air. Luckily, this particular booster was also not a complete loss. After being released by the helicopter, the booster parachute redeployed and carried it down for a soft splashdown in the water. Rocket Lab was able to quickly fish the booster out with a boat and carry it safely back to shore. Beck says that the company will return the booster to their factory, where it will be stripped down, inspected, tested, and then refurbished for a second launch. When someone asked on Twitter about taking one of the spent rocket engines, Beck replied, Sorry, they are going back to space, I reckon. So this may still count as a reusable rocket, even if the circumstances were not perfect. So if it turns out to be relatively easy to parachute a rocket booster and maybe even catch it with a helicopter, then why isn't anyone else doing this? There is a ton of money being lost by just letting rockets fall into the ocean like lawn darts. Beck says that the booster section of the Electron makes up between 70 and 80% of the cost for the entire vehicle so there are massive savings in reusing it. Well, the Electron is kind of a special rocket with unique characteristics that make it ideal for this kind of operation. For one, it is much more narrow than your average rocket booster, just 1.2 meters, compared to something like a Falcon 9 at 3.7 meters diameter or a ULA Atlas V at 3.8 meters. And in addition to a smaller size, the Electron gets a further weight advantage from its carbon composite structure. This is the reason that you see carbon fiber body panels used on race cars. It offers a significantly lower mass while still retaining the strength of metal. Rocket Lab actually claims that their carbon composite is stronger than steel. You might have seen the demonstration where Peter Beck smashed a battering ram into various rocket materials. Remember that the Electron booster weighs less than one metric ton by the time it comes back down on that parachute, while a Falcon 9 booster would be coming in at over 25 metric tons of dry mass. Rocket Lab is able to manufacture the carbon fiber body of the Electron in just 12 hours, thanks to an automated process that they nicknamed Rosie the Robot. The company targets about seven days to build an entire Electron. The engines that they use to power the booster are special as well. There are nine Rutherford engines in the first stage of the Electron, delivering about 16 metric tons of thrust each. They are small, but mighty engines. One really unique aspect of the Rutherford is the electric pump feed on the engine. A typical rocket engine will use a gas generator turbine that is spun by pressure from either the fuel tank, the oxidizer tank, or the engine exhaust gas, and that turbine will power the pumps that push fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. Rocket Lab is the only engine maker to spin their pumps with electric motors that are powered by lithium ion batteries. Three of these batteries are hot swapped to the second stage of the rocket to power it into orbit, and the other two batteries are jettisoned once they are depleted to shed mass. Rocket Lab claims that this gives their engine nearly double the efficiency of a regular gas generator cycle. 
In addition to being the Tesla of rocket engines, the Rutherford also has an advanced manufacturing process called electron beam melting. It's basically a fancy take on 3D printing. The combustion chamber, injectors, pumps, and main propellant valves of the Rutherford are all 3D printed, and this allows for a very fast and affordable production line for these engines. As of right now, we're not sure when Rocket Lab will be attempting another catch. Peter Beck said that the company will be using the lessons they just learned to improve their method for next time, saying, quote, we'll probably update our simulator to simulate the load accurately to what it was, go out and do a bunch of tests to get comfortable with the update load case. Beck estimates that in the future, about half of Rocket Lab's missions will utilize reusable rockets. Night launches will be a big limiting factor because the helicopter can't see the booster, or launches that require the rocket's full capability. Rocket Lab loses about 10% of payload capacity on the Electron in its reusable configuration. We know that there is another big launch on the calendar for Rocket Lab coming later this month. The Electron will be sending NASA's CubeSat named Capstone to orbit around the moon. Capstone will take four months to go into a near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon, the same orbit NASA plans to use for the Lunar Gateway Station. Its primary mission will be testing the stability of the orbit and conducting navigation experiments with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So that's how you catch a rocket with a helicopter. It's a wild idea, but it's one of many things that make Rocket Lab such an interesting company to follow. And they definitely have a lot more to come. So let us know what you think is coming in the future. Is the helicopter catch going to work next time? And would you like to see more regular videos on Rocket Lab here on the Space Race? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.